We have a special guest speaker here today. Um, he comes from Hearst, Texas. That's uh, somewhere between Dallas and Fort Worth. Is that correct? Yes. Dr. James Trim. He is um, the president of the Society of the Advancement of Nazarene Judaism. And it's a fast-growing organization with many affiliating. It's growing, I don't know, somewhat 600 6,000 percent over how? 2,000% over 10 months. That's a lot of growth. That's some fast growth, exciting growth. And so his hands are full. A lot of things are happening. He's going to come up and share with us in uh, the service today. And he's going to talk about uh, the Torah passage as is found in the Torah reading this week. He holds a doctorate in Semitic studies. And so um, his challenge, of course, is to communicate on a level that we can understand. But regardless of that ability of his to communicate on our level, there's always very, very in, interesting insights into the text that he brings. And so uh, we want to welcome you, James. Come on up. We bless you and thank you for coming out to speak to us as well. He's only confused on one doctrinal point that I can see, and that is that he thinks uh, somehow that Texas is the promised land, but we're going to straighten him out on that. Well, shalom, everybody. I was uh, down in Texas. There's a, uh, uh, down in the Fort Worth area, one of the largest seminaries in the world is uh, the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary down there. They have the lar- what I'm told is the largest theological library in the world. It's the Roberts Theological Library. This thing is three stories high. Okay, it's a building all to itself, three stories high, and it's all theology books. They have a huge Judaica section. It's bigger than the Fort Worth Public Library, the main library for, for, the, for Fort Worth. Okay? It's larger than the city library for most cities. And so I just go there to do research because there's, they have wonderful Judaica section and just all kinds of resources there. And so I was on my way home, and across the street from there, there's a Baptist bookstore. It's a good place to put a Baptist bookstore with a seminary right across the street, you know. And, but it's summer, and things are slow at the seminary during the summer. And so they, I thought I'd pop in there to see what they had. They had a sale going and uh, trying to generate a little more business with the seminary kind of slow for the, you know, for the semester, for the summer. So I went back and up against this back wall, they had all these different books up there, and I was looking at some of the titles of them, and one of them said Greek Thought in the New Testament. Another one said Hellenistic Thought in the New Testament. Another one said The Greek Origin of the New Testament. Another one said Western Philosophy in the New Testament. And uh, so this uh, bookstore clerk comes up behind me and says, yeah, all these books are 50% off. And so I looked at him and said, yeah, probably more than that. But there really is, there's a, 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 a Greek Hellenistic paradigm, because our civilization is based on Hellenism. Our civilization descends indirectly from the Roman Empire. Our law is based on the Roman Empire. Our whole bar- paradigm, if you will, our whole way of looking at things is from the Hellenistic perspective that's so condemned in the Bible. Okay? And so... Um, there, there's, a, there's a whole shift that has to be made in our way of thinking. You know, there's a lot, of, a lot of talk these days about, especially in Protestantism, about getting back to the New Testament church. I mean, I mean how many people have heard about that? Let's, you know, get back to the New Testament church. What are two things the New Testament church didn't have? The New Testament and the church. <laughs> I mean, back in, in the days of the New Testament, the New Testament hadn't been written yet, obviously. And they weren't meeting in churches, they were meeting in synagogues, uh, according to the book of James. And so they were, uh, uh, it was a whole different thing. Now that's a, that, has a, you know, that can be a really just a fun thing to say, but the reality of it is can be found in the New Testament. Because when Paul was teaching the Bereans, what does it say that the Bereans did when Paul went to go teach them in uh, Acts 17? Search the scriptures. They were getting out their Gideon New Testaments to see if what he said was in there, right? No. What, what scriptures were then were the Bereans searching when Paul was teaching? They didn't believe a word Paul said. They checked to see if what Paul was saying was in the scriptures. And what scriptures were they looking in? 
the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Okay. And, what, and Paul said, oh, you're looking in uh, old wineskins for new wine. He said, oh, this is all new revelation. You're not going to find it in there. All, all the old things have been done away and are new in Christ. No. <laughs> That's not what Paul said. Paul said that they were more honorable than any of the other people he'd been teaching because they checked to see if what he was teaching could be found in the Tanakh. And that means that we are authorized by the New Testament to take the following approach to our understandings. Ask yourself all the time about whether it's a tradition that's come down to you or an understanding of what the New Testament says. Ask yourself, can you get here from there? There being the Tanakh. If you were one of those Bereans back then in the first century, checking to see if it was in the Tanakh, would you find it there? And how... What did these things mean in terms of the Tanakh? Think like a Berean, okay? <clears throat> and so uh, let's look at uh, today's Torah Parsha, or this week's Torah Parsha, uh, is Devarim chapter 7. I believe it starts in, what, verse 15? And ends in 1124. We're not going to read it, the whole Parsha. I hope that you've been studying it or that you... I guess the way the reformat works show that you will be studying it in the in the coming week. But there's two passages particularly that just scream out at you in this particular Torah reading. The first one is in Devarim 10:16. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy. Devarim's the Hebrew name. I have uh, this is this is what Marty, I I have to explain something. I was never in the church. I was, a, I was going to synagogue. When I was 18, I came to the belief that Yeshua was the Messiah. And so I don't have the background. You know, to me, it's Devarim. <laughs> uh, it's Deuteronomy. Chapter 10, verse 16. Actually, just one verse up from the passage that uh, Ernie was speaking about earlier. It says, Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Gee, I thought that was some kind of a New Testament thing. You mean they had circumcised hearts? That's, isn't that interesting? And then look at, down at chapter 11, verse 18. Chapter 11, verse 18, a little bit further down, down says, Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart, what, what words were that, was that in this context? The Torah. Wait a minute, you mean that these people had the Torah in their hearts? I mean, this is profound. Stop and think about it. It's in the wilderness. The 40 years in the wilderness. This is not New Testament stuff. And the people had the Torah written in their hearts? They had circumcised hearts? Well, my, I thought that was some kind of a New Testament thing. See, a lot of things that we think is something new is something old. All right? Now, that helps us understand the new in context. Okay? Because we can understand that this is this having... How many people have talked to somebody about Torah and had them respond to you, well, yeah, but I don't have to keep the Torah because my, I have a circumcised heart, or I don't have to keep the Torah because I have the Torah written in my heart. How many have run into that argument? Well, that's nothing new. That was true when Moses was stoning people to death for violating the Sabbath during the 40 years in the wilderness. Why didn't those people say, you know, when they were being lined up to be stoned to death for violating Sabbath, oh, but Moses, I have the law written in my heart. I don't think that would have flown, do you? I don't think that, you know, I think most probably would have said, well, <laughs> the, if you have the Torah written in your heart, you wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> it is said, if you've got some kind of Torah written in your heart, it's not the same Torah I was given on Mount Sinai because that Torah says don't violate Shabbat. Okay. So, in fact, we get a good definition for, circum for circumcision of the heart early on. In other words, when we read something that somebody writes later in the Bible, they're using terminology from earlier. We look to the earlier passages. It's called the rule of first reference. We go back to the earlier passages to get the definition of what they're talking about. Okay, So what is circumcision of the heart? Verse 16, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart 
and be no more stiff-necked. That's 10.16. So circumcising the heart had to do with not being stiff-necked. What did that mean in context of this Torah Parsha in the section of Torah? Stubborn, but more. Let's, get, let's be specifically what was, were, were they rebellion against what? Torah. Lawlessness. Exactly. They were rebelling against Torah and circumcision of the heart had to do with getting rid of your own stubbornness and your own stiff-neckedness and giving in to Torah. That's what it was about. People don't want Torah, by and large. People don't want rules. If you uh, watch TV lately, one of the biggest advertising campaigns that's been going the last few years is a big, big phrase. You'll see it all over the place. No rules. No rules, just fun, or something like that. You've seen it, haven't you? Yeah. Because advertisers know what people like. People don't like rules. Okay? What does the word Torah really mean? Teaching. Yes. Law is a very bad translation. The, word, the Hebrew word Torah actually means guidance or instruction. Now, while one might say the law is not for today, who would say... God's law and guidance is not for today. Or, I'm sorry, God's teaching and guidance is not for today. That'd be silly. Okay? <clears throat> so, let me ask you, what could God possibly have said, God foreknowing, God being omnipotent, all-knowing, what could he possibly, you know, he could foresee every false doctrine we could come up with before we ever even came up with it. So let me ask you a question. What could he possibly have told us ahead of time in the Scriptures to tell us that his Torah was, would be forever, would, would never expire? Can anybody tell me what, what kinds of things he might, we might expect him to say if he was going to, t to give that idea to us? It would be always. Anything else? Forever? Eternal? Any, anything else? There's one phrase that I really particularly like because there's some people that will nitpick on that word eternal and say, well, it means this or that. So over and over and over again, he uses this key phrase that you'll see. For, for, there you go. So anybody doesn't misunderstand what forever means, I always say forever means forever, and that's for all forever ever means. But if anybody should misunderstand what forever means in those passages, he goes on to say, he adds the phrase, for all your generations. Are there Jews still, still Jews on the earth? Yeah. Okay. Then if the Torah has been done away with, God is a liar. It's that simple. I mean, you can't have it both ways. There's a theory out there, and some of you that might have even had some experience with seminary have probably heard this theory. That theory in Christian circles that goes around is this. It says that God gave the Torah for the purpose of proving that we couldn't do it. Okay, you, How many of you have heard that? Okay. Now let's think this through logically, okay? Let's just think it through. God comes to Israel, comes to Moshe, gives him the Torah, and gives it to the people. And he tells them specifically in that Torah, in uh, Devarim 30, Deuteronomy 30, that, it is, that they should not tell him it's too hard for them to do, but that it is not too hard for them, that it is near to them, that they may keep it. And he tells them in Deuteronomy 28 and 29 all these bad things that he's going to do to them as a people if they do not keep Torah. And then, for hundreds of years, he sends prophets to them telling them, look, if you don't straighten out your act, I'm going to do those things. I'm going to bring in foreign nations against you. you, are going, you know, you're going to suffer if you do not keep Torah. And then, sure enough, 600 B.C., God brings in Babylon, and Babylon conquers the people of Israel, slaughters many of them, drives them out into the nations. And look at all of the things that our people have suffered right down to being slaughtered through for hundreds of years because we have not been faithful to Torah. And then the New Testament God comes along and says, Nah, I was only kidding. I just gave it to you to prove you couldn't do it. What kind of God would that make him? Think about that. That's, that's not the, the God of the Torah. 
He doesn't come along and say, huh, I just, you know, I gave it to you and then I punished you for not doing it, but the whole thing was just a joke. I was just trying to prove you couldn't do it. <clears throat> the paradigm shift that we have is that we've been sold a bill of goods. That bill of goods is that the Torah is bondage. And that freedom in Christ, if you will, means freedom from Torah. How many have heard that or have, have gotten that kind of a message? Okay. Now, that is abs the funny thing is that the Scriptures teach that exactly the opposite is true. Let me show you from the Scriptures. Let's look at John chapter 8. Verses 31 through 32. Yeshua, it says, And then Yeshua said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay? All right, that's good. The truth makes you free. That, isn't that nice? That's nice. Let's look now. Let's be a Berean, and let's ask ourselves, okay, what is truth? We go to Psalm 119, verse 142. By the way, Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the Bible. I'm sorry, it's the longest chapter in the entire Bible. Old Testament, New Testament, whole thing. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. Psalms is the only book that was divided into chapters from the beginning, by the way. And it's the longest chapter. Now let me ask you a question. Obviously God had thought that the material in Psalm 119 was pretty important, huh? What is Psalm 119 about? Does anybody know? Torah. Delighting in the Torah, loving the Torah, over and over and over again. That's what Psalm 119 is about. Okay, so let's look at verse 142. You can tell it's long when I tell you look at verse 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your Torah is is truth. You see that? Verse 142. And then just a little bit down, verse 151. You are near, O Yahweh, and all of your commandments are truth. Do you see that? The Torah is truth, right? That's more or less God's definition of truth. Torah. So when Yeshua says that you will abide in my word and, the tr and shall know the truth and the truth will make you free, what's the truth? The Torah. The Torah makes you free? Isn't that interesting? The Torah makes you free according to the Scriptures. Now that fits the picture, by the way. Let's go back and think back to the original events back at Passover. In fact, I touched on this when I was here a few months ago on Passover. The story of the... Uh, Exodus. The people come out from Egypt, and what were they in in Egypt? Bondage. And then they go over to Mount Sinai. God takes them over to Mount Sinai and gives them Torah. Now what did God promise them? Freedom. And He takes them out of bondage and He goes over there and He gives them Torah. Now, does it make sense that God would take them out of bondage, promise them freedom, and then take them over and put them under bondage? That's, that's just dumb. Let's look at another passage that really gets misunderstood and misused a lot. Matthew chapter 11. Verses 28 through 30. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, 
and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How many people have had that quoted to you in such a way as to imply that the yoke of the Torah is bondage and the yoke of the Messiah is freedom? How many? Yeah, there's at least two, three, four, five, everybody. You've all heard that. Let's be Bereans again. Did you know that Yeshua is actually quoting from the Tanakh here? If you have a good edition that's got footnotes, it will footnote that to Jeremiah 6.16. So let's go look at Jeremiah 6.16. Let's be Bereans here. Jeremiah 6.16 Thus says Yahweh, Stand you in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. You see that? Is that not the passage he's quoting from? All right. Let's keep going to get the context here. Also, I set watchmen over you, saying, hearken, and sound of the, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. Therefore, hear, you nations, and know, O you congregation, what is, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because you have not hearkened unto my words, nor my Torah, but rejected it. What's going on here? This is the passage he's quoting from. Now let's look up just a little bit for context. Chapter 5, verses 4 through 5. And find out what this yoke that he's talking about is all about. Jeremiah. Chapter 5, verses 4 through 5. Therefore I said, Surely these are poor, they are foolish, for they know not the way of the Lord, or the way of Yahweh, nor the judgment of their God. I will get me unto the great men, and will speak unto them, for they have known the way of Yahweh, and the judgment of their God. For these have altogether broken the yoke, and burst the bond. What yoke? The yoke of Torah. Let's look just a little bit further up from that. In Jeremiah, to get even more t- context, chapter 2, verse 20. For of old time I have broken your yoke and burst your bonds, and you said, I will not transgress when upon every high hill and under every green tree you wanderest playing the harlot. The context here is again, what is the yoke of the yoke here? Torah. Now, let's go back and reread what Yeshua said and read it in, in, uh, with an understanding of the passage that he's quoting from and what the context is, that that passage does refer to a yoke that gives freedom. Okay? that gives rest, but that yoke that gives rest in Jeremiah is Torah. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What yoke is it talking about now that we've looked back in Jeremiah at the passage he was quoting from? Torah. Isn't it sad that these people have twisted the Scriptures so thoroughly they don't even go back to Jeremiah to look at what Yeshua is quoting? If Yeshua is talking about about another yoke as opposed to Torah in this passage, then he's quoting Jeremiah out of context, and he's the you know probably the biggest cultist there ever was. Okay? All right, let's look at some more. The Torah is freedom. Did you know that? We already talked about that. Let's look back at Psalm 119 again. Beautiful Psalm. Psalms 1 and Psalm 19 and Psalm 119 are beautiful Psalms about Torah. Let's look at verse 32. Verse 32. 
I, this is King David talking. Now remember, King David was a man after God's own heart, and King David was saved by grace through faith, according to Paul and everything, okay? Verse 32, I will run the way of your commandments when you shall enlarge my heart. Any other translations out there? This is a KJV. I'm sorry? Okay. Some translations say at liberty. Let's look at another one. Verse one, um, verse 45. Here we go. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. Same word. Okay? So, and then let's look at James real quick here. Yaakov, chapter 1, verse 25. But whoso looks onto the perfect law of liberty. And then 2.12. So speak you, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. You see that? So is there a conflict between Torah and liberty? Torah and freedom? No. Real freedom doesn't include uh, the uh, freedom to violate Torah. Never did. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> now, let's look at back to our Torah, Torah portion. You know, people will ask me, do I have to keep Torah to be saved? Have you ever heard that, you know? Do I have to keep Torah to be saved? And I'll say, I'll answer a question with a question. You know why Jews always answer a question with a question? Why not? <laughs> so uh, they'll say, well, do I have to keep Torah to be saved? And I'll say, no. Then I'll say, do you have to get cleaned up to take a bath? We're going to kind of get a feel for that here. Chapter 11, verse 1 of Devarim says, or De Deuteronomy, Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. Is that familiar? Does that sound like a New Testament passage? John 14, 15. Yeshua says, If you love me, You'll keep my commandments. Now, how do we love God? Well, yeah, that's the end result. Last week's Torah Parsha included some of the most famous piece of Jewish literature ever. <laughs> the Shema. And the Shema says that we will love the Lord our God three ways. How? With all of our heart. No. Soul. Strength. There you go. There you go. There's the three. Now, what is the word for soul in Hebrew? Does anybody know? Nefesh. Nefesh. Nefesh also means life or self. So the idea that we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our selves, our lives, our soul, and all of our might. What is the implication of might? That means that you're doing something, that there's effort that you do something, okay? And we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, and our might. In other words, with all that you are. In other words, you take yourself and you give it over to Him. This is what having a circumcised heart is in Leviticus 10.16. Getting rid of the stiff neck, the stubbornness. Getting rid of our wants. And giving it over to Him. To his wants. This is the ultimate act of this was Yeshua in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, Not your will, not want my will, but your will be done. Okay, so when we when we circ when we love God with all that we are, we circumcise our hearts, and then he can write Torah in our hearts. He can change us and make us want to do his will. Okay? But we have to take we have to to start the process ourselves. It says 
in Leviticus 10, 6, uh, 10, 10.16, circumcise your hearts. That's something you do. You know, I once talked to somebody that said, you know, I started keeping the Sabbath, but I didn't find God in it. And I said, you know, one time I lost my glasses. And it took me a long time before I found them. You know why? And they said, no. And I said, because I didn't look for them. <laughs> now, what is faith or trust Belief, is the, uh, and Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. What does that word really mean? Um, the Hebrew word is emunah, and emunah can mean belief, trust, or uh, faith. Now, if I was to say, Mark, are you faithful to your wife? You would look at me and say, why, yes, I believe she exists. I'd say, Mark, I don't, I'm not asking you if you believe she exists. I'm asking you about your faith and your trust. It's a whole different issue. This is why James says the demons believe and, sh and tremble. It's a whole different issue. You could acknowledge the existence of God and be a serial killer. Okay? All right. Now, if the Torah is truth, then... And, and the Messiah taught truth and said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Let's look at what the enemy does in, in the same chapter of John, chapter 8. <clears throat> Verse 44. And you are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He is a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. One translation I thought was rather humorous says that when the devil speaks a lie, he's speaking his native language. Okay? Now, if the Torah is truth, then what would we expect the adversary, Satan, to be teaching? Anti-Torah, against the Torah. Now, there's a Greek word that appears in the Greek New Testament over and over, many times. I'm going to look at three places, key places where it appears. How many people know what the Greek word for Torah is? Anybody? Ernie? Nomos? Okay, now there's a Greek prefix A. The Greek prefix A, does anybody know what that prefix means? Against, or literally, there is not, or without. Okay, now there is a Greek word that appears in the New Testament several times, A nomos. I, I'm not teaching a big Greek class here, but that's enough Greek to figure out what A nomos means. What does A nomos mean? Without Torah, or there is no Torah, or apart from the Torah. Now, I'm going to look at three passages where this word appears in the Greek New Testament. The first is in Matthew 24, 12. Matthew 24, 12, and I'm reading here from the New King James Version, or is it the King I'm reading from the King James Version here. It says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Many of your translations will be more literal and say lawlessness there. The Greek word there is anomos, without Torah. Okay? So Yeshua, in Matthew 24, he's talking about future events. He predicts an apostate teaching that will spread that we're without the Torah. That there is no Torah. The Torah has been done away. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Starting in verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord 
shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and all the, de- all the deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth, which is Torah, that they might be saved. Love. Okay? But, if you've got a, uh, uh, this is the King James Version, most of your more modern translations have lawless one here. Is that what you got? Anybody have lawless one? Okay? The word there is, guess what? The anomos one. The one that is without Torah. This is the title of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to be a champion of the idea that there is no Torah. No rules. Let's back up to Matthew chapter 7. And this one is probably going to be chilling. Matthew chapter 7. Starting in verse 21 through verse 23. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name have cast out devils, and your name have done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never know you, knew you, depart from me, you that work iniquity, in the King James Version. How many have lawlessness? Yeah. The Greek has anomos, you who work without the Torah. Let that sink in a little bit. Okay. Now, there is a great deal that has been misunderstood in the Scriptures on the topic of the Torah, especially in the New Testament. And that is because there's a lot of passage, and I'm not going to have time to cover it all because... I've only got just a few minutes here altogether to counter nearly 2,000 years of misapplication. So what I'll I'll, uh, start here with is the issue of Paul. Paul was greatly misunderstood. How many people have heard of Paul as being the champion of the idea that the Torah was done away with, above all, of all of all others. Okay. The scriptures say that Paul was misunderstood. Second uh, Peter chapter three verse fifteen through sixteen says, uh, Kepha is writing about Paul, and he says, "And which are some things hard to understand, which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures." Okay? So first thing we need to note is that Paul was being misunderstood by a large group of people even in the first century. Okay? Then, let's look at what Paul says about people misunderstanding him. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 8, And why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say? Okay. He elaborates on what that's all about further in the book of Romans in chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. He says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Okay. And then in verse 15 he says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. Okay. So Paul says he was being misunderstood about the question of whether one should continue to sin because we are under grace. Now, he says, do we continue to sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. He also says something else. He says, I would not have known sin if it was not for the Torah, doesn't he? So what can we gather from that? That we're not to violate Torah that grace may abound. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, in Acts chapter 21, Paul comes into Jerusalem. You've all heard the story before, and he's being misunderstood about this. He, they come to him, James the Just comes to him and says, hey, there's many Jews here that are all zealous for the Torah. 
And uh, they've heard that you're teaching against the Torah, basically. That they've been, you've been teaching the Jews amongst the Gentiles not to observe the customs of Moses and so on. And what, is Paul, what do they do? Well, they say, hey, tell you what, prove this isn't so. Let's go, uh, we've got some people here that are, ta- that are ready to take the Nazarite vow. That's in, from uh, the Torah, from Numbers chapter 6. And uh, why don't you go with them? and go to the temple and take the Nazarite vow with them and make offerings at the temple. And that will prove that you uphold the law of Moses and that what they're saying isn't true. And Paul said, well, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I wouldn't do that if my life depended on it. Of course I'm not going to go. And of course, what did he say? He said, great, let's do it. (laughs) So he went to the temple and they took the Nazarite vow and they made offerings. That doesn't mean they passed the collection plate. If you go back and look at Numbers chapter 6, there's a select group of offerings that are made when one takes the Nazarite vow. They were in the temple killing some animals. Okay? In Numbers ch- in, uh, in Acts chapter 21. Now, if you've got a Ryrie study Bible, just to see how perverse the antinomians have gotten in their you know, approach, if you've got a Ryrie study Bible, and you go to Acts chapter 21, and you find the spot where Paul is performing these animal sacrifices, there's a footnote in the Ryrie Study Bible that, calls, that says that Paul, after all, was just a middle-of-the-road Jewish Christian. Isn't that amazing? So Paul's teachings were twisted. Over and over again, in fact, he professed that he had not uh, taught against the Torah. It says in... He circumcised Timothy in Acts 16, uh, 1 through 3. He took the Nazarite vow in Acts 21 and Acts 18, 18. He taught and observed the Jewish holidays. Um, and he even performed animal sacrifices in the temple, as we just discussed in Acts 21, verses 17 through 26, and Acts 24, 17 through 18. Now here's four of his most notable sayings on the topic. The first is from Acts 25, 8. He says, Neither against the Jewish law, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I offended in anything at all. Now, if we believe the antinomian uh, out there, the antinomians, Paul would have to be a liar. Let's look down the next one. Uh, Acts 28, 17. Paul is speaking. I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers. Boy, if the antinomian position is true, then he's a bold-faced liar. Let's keep going. Romans 7.12. The law is holy, and the com- commandment is holy, just, and good. And then Romans 3.31. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we maintain the law. I don't have time to explain, go through all of the epistles of Paul and explain everything that's been misunderstood in them, but I can knock out most of it by uh, attacking two or covering two phrases that are catchwords that Paul uses that have been misunderstood. The first one is works of the law, and the other one is under the law. Okay? Works of the law we can get a good definition of from Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. It says, Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Yeshua the Messiah, even we uh, have believed in Messiah Yeshua, that we might be justified in faith in Messiah and not by works of the law, for by works of the law no flesh shall be justified. All right, so Paul sees works of the law as being completely contrary to faith in the Messiah, right? Now, we've got we to gotta get over uh, something that's like 2,000 years old here, because even though most Protestants don't believe this anymore, historically they did, and so their theology is rooted in it. And that idea is that people in the Old Testament were saved by law, and people in the New Testament are saved by faith. Now, most Protestants, when you talk to them today, would say, no, no man was, they would quote Galatians right from this section and say, no man was say, uh, works of the law saved no man at any time, ever. Nobody could earn their salvation, ever. Couldn't happen. Nobody can earn their salvation. All right, so we get rid of the idea that in old days, people were saved by keeping works of the law. 
That's, that, that understanding is not agreeable. Okay. So when Paul uses the phrase works of the law, and he sees it as diametrically opposed to faith in the Messiah, he is not talking about an obsolete Old Testament system, is he? Can't be. Even by Protestant understanding, he can't be. But that's the way they take works of the law, because that goes back to their root when they once taught that people were saved by keeping the law. Okay? So works of the law, then, is a phrase, a catchphrase that Paul uses. He uses it ten times in his writings to refer challenging us that we were, you know, they wanted us to, to explain where we were because they were concerned that we were teaching heresy, basically. And so I showed this to them, uh, and I asked, you know, and they, even they could see this, apparently, although I think the, the guy that was leading them was just going like this. He couldn't believe I was up there teaching them. <laughs> but chapter 4, let's look at chapter 5, first of all. Chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Galatians, I'm sorry. If you could point to a book that the antinomians like to, to retreat to and hide behind the most, what book would it be? Galatians. In high places, Sunday night, I'm going to go through the whole book of Galatians and explain all of these things, but right here I'm just going to explain this one. Galatians 4.21. I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse 1. Stand, there, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Messiah has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say, to you that, uh, say unto you that if you become circumcised, Messiah shall profit you nothing. How many have had that quoted to them? Please, show of hands, if you've heard that quoted at you. All right. Now, What's the first thing, if you've ever studied hermeneutics, hermeneutics is the way you go about interpreting the scriptures, what's the first thing you ask yourself when you interpret a text? Speak up, please. Huh? Well, that's, that's one. There's basically three big things. One is context. I'm sorry? Yeah, but that's not one of the... That's not one of the top three. The really big ones are who is it written to and who is the speaker. Okay? you got to know who the speaker is and who he's speaking to. Now in this passage it says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Messiah has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you be circumcised, Messiah shall profit you nothing. Now it seems to me it would be foremost on our mind to understand who's being spoken to here, huh? That's key to this passage. Now let's look back up to the context where this begins in chapter 4, verse 21. Tell me, you that desire to be under the Torah, do you not hear the Torah? So the you that this is speaking to, remember we already defined that under the Torah, under the law, is not an obsolete Old Testament system. It's a false teaching that was never true that Paul combats. It was, it was a false teaching that was never true. It was a heresy. So Paul is saying, you who are wanting to go into this heretical sect, want it to, to, to depart from the truth and into heresy, if you become circumcised, Messiah will profit you nothing. Okay, so okay, you just go under the go into this under the Torah thing. Your circumcision won't mean anything anyway. Okay? Now let's continue on after verse twenty one. Verses twenty three through twenty two through thirty one tell the uh, the parable of the free woman and the bondwoman. Okay? Now, the bondwoman represents the under-the-law teaching in this context from verse 21, whereas the free woman represents the Torah because they're being contrasted in verse 21, right? The Torah is being contrasted with the under-the-law teaching in verse 21. So in verse 22 forward through the end of the chapter, the, two, the, under the, the, uh, the, the contrast between the bondwoman 
which represents under the Torah, is being contrasted with the Torah itself. That's really important because then chapter 5, verse 1, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Messiah has made us free, then would represent Paul and the Torah. And the following passage, the following verse, or passage, I'm sorry, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage would refer to the under the Torah teaching. The false theology that was never true, not the Old Testament system. All right? And then you read verse 2, Behold, Paul, I, Paul, say to you that if you be circumcised, Messiah will profit you nothing. Who is you? You as those that are wanting to enter into this false theology. And the whole rest of the book, or the rest of the chapter 5, is therefore being addressed to who? You. You who, who want to enter into this false theology. It doesn't apply to me. It doesn't apply to all the Galatians. It doesn't apply to everyone. It applies to a specific group of people. It's being explained here in verse 20, chapter 4, verse 21. Basic hermeneutics. Okay. So, uh, with that, we're going to go ahead. Is it okay if I open for questions? Is that okay with the format? Do we have time? Way over. Okay. Tell you what, if anybody has any questions, I'll just I'll be around. So you can come up to me after the meeting and, and ask any questions you might have. Go ahead and turn it over to you, Mark. Why don't you stand with me? I've had the um, opportunity to have James over, and, and we just talk for hours and hours. And then my wife says, that's it. You're out. Can't you guys talk about something you know, like baseball or raising kids or what you like for dinner, you know, and, but, uh, just so many questions, so many questions. And so, um, God has been gracious and he's been good to all of us and uh, we're all in process. So father, we just thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you for Torah. We thank you that in Messiah, we've been justified. We've been cleansed. We've been major people that you've given us this great heritage to walk out. We rejoice in that. We have said over and over and over that your ways are good. We have tasted and we have seen that your ways are good. And so we rejoice in that today. And we ask that you would be with us as we uh, go from this place, that your spirit would fill us and lead us and direct us, and that those blessings would come to each and every one of us, and to our loved ones, to Israel. For it's in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.